My name is John Herbst. I'm the director of the Dino Patrizio Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. And we've got a wonderful program for you today to talk about the um, Kremlin intervention in Syria, its impact, and prospects. Uh, I'd like to spend a special welcome to our speakers, especially those who have come from, from the Middle East and from Russia. We've got a wonderful program for you. Uh, we have members of our board here, and I thank them for, for attending. Uh, this event would not have been possible without the support of the Talent of Nations Foundation. I'd like to thank them very much for, for sponsoring this. For those of you following us online, this event is being live streamed on our website, www.atlanticcouncil.org. And you can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag um, AC Russia and the handle AC Eurasia. Without any further delay, I'll turn this over to Alina Polyakova, Dr. Polyakova, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Ambassador Herbst. My name is Lena Polyakova. I'm the Associate Director here at the Dean and Patricia Eurasia Center. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our very distinguished panel today. Um, just very brief introductions, as I think none of our guests actually require a long introduction as they're well known and regarded in their own fields. We have Ambassador uh, Fred Hoff, who is a resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Rafik Hariri Center for the Middle East. Ambassador Hoff served as advisor on Syria to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and was special advisor for transition in Syria in the Obama administration. And we also have Dr. Vladislav Inazyantsev, who is professor of economics at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow and founder and director for the Center of Post-Industrial Studies. We caught him on his uh, fellowship here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and so very happy to have him with us. And we also have, uh, among our very distinguished guests, Dr. Angela Stent, um, who is professor and director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and Eastern European Studies here at Georgetown University. And she's currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and at the Transatlantic Academy. And we also have Dr. Mark Katz, who is professor of government politics at George Mason University, and who was a visiting scholar at the Middle East Policy Council. Um, and last but definitely not least, we have Ambassador Nabil Fahmi, who's the former Minister of Foreign Affairs and the founding dean of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the American University in Cairo. And our distinguished panel we moderated today by our very own amb Ambassador Francis Richard Doney, who is the Atlantic Council's Vice President and Director of the Rafi Kariri Center for the Middle East. Ambassador Richard Doney served as U.S. Ambassador to Turkey, Egypt, and to the Philippines and Palau. So without much further ado, I'd like to invite our panelists to take their seats on stage. Thank you, uh, John and Alina, for uh, getting us all started today. I'd like to welcome, join in welcoming everyone to the Atlantic Council. We uh, take uh, great pride in bringing voices from the region in whenever we discuss uh, regional events. We take great pride also in, in being multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. In this case, we have the Eurasia Center and the Rafiq uh, Hariri Center for the Middle East working together on this uh, fundamentally cross uh, regional uh, issue and problem today, even as uh, American diplomats and Russian diplomats and Middle Eastern diplomats are all together in New York wrestling with the same problem we'll be discussing here today. Um, so I would like to just go right to our experts to uh, begin speaking. I should note that um, uh, both of our uh, principal uh, discussants here today will be uh, speaking from papers that they'll be presenting um, early in the new year. They'll be publishing, so you're getting a pre-publication uh, taste of what they'll be coming out with. So, uh, Ambassador Hoff, if you'd like to begin. Well, thank you. Thank you, Frank. This, uh, the, the paper to which uh, Frank refers that'll be published, I think, in the new year, uh, rests basically on, on five assumptions. Uh, number one, that Russia and Iran, for separate but entirely compatible reasons, want to keep Bashar al-Assad in power 
indefinitely for the foreseeable future, at least in part of Syria. Second assumption is that the nature of the military campaign being waged by Russian aircraft and Iranian assembled militias in Syria against armed groups, not ISIL, fighting the Assad regime defines Russian and Iranian priorities in Syria. For both, the battle against ISIL seems to be a Potemkin pretext for assembling forces aiming to eliminate alternatives both to Assad and ISIL. Third assumption underlying this work is, is that for Iran, keeping Assad in power mainly has to do with Assad's willingness over the years to subordinate Syria to Iran on all matters related to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Keeping Hezbollah fit to fight Israel and politically dominant in Lebanon are crucial Iranian national security priorities. Assad has delivered. Iran fears that there is no constituency for this particular relationship in Syria uh, beyond the ruling family and its enablers. It sees Bashar personally as embodying whatever residual legitimacy is left uh, to this regime. Fourth, for Russia, Assad's continued incumbency proclaims Moscow's return to great power status. Uh, Putin claims that Washington has been on a democratization and regime change jihad since 2003 in Iraq. He wants to stop it cold in Syria. He wants ideally to confront President Obama with a binary choice between the barrel bomber on the one hand and Caliph uh, Baghdadi on the other. He wants President Obama to eat his 2011 words on Assad stepping aside. Russia, I believe, sees the Vienna diplomatic process as a time-buying instrument. Russian military operations in Syria are fully consistent with the goal of forcing binary choice on Washington. Uh, but it'll take time to create the requisite military facts on the ground. An extended process can provide time, although I have strong doubts uh, that Russia militarily will be able to achieve this objective. Now, these assumptions, these five assumptions, might either now or in the fullness of time prove to be absolutely erroneous. Russia and Iran may come to see Bashar al-Assad as expendable. John Kerry may persuade them that a continuing political role for this regime is indeed poisonous to the prospect of a united Syrian front against ISIL. I think they already know this. It's just that their interests lie elsewhere. But this is just my opinion. On the other hand, the Russians may actually think that the Turkmen they're currently pounding in northern Latakia province really are ISIL. Maybe Iran thinks that there is a genuine appetite in Syria for subordination that transcends the Assad family. So because my assumptions may be wrong, I've tried to devise an alternate Syria strategy for Obama administration consideration that would not, would not be at odds with the current Vienna process. My proposed alternative is based on, the assumption, is based on an assumption about the kind of Syria President Barack Obama ideally would like to hand off to his successor. Such a Syria, I think, would have the following characteristics. Uh, one, ISIL would be gone. Two, Assad and his entourage would be gone. Three, Syria's territorial integrity would be intact. Four, an inclusive national unity government in Damascus would consolidate stability, protect vulnerable groups, 
preserve governmental institutions, including the military and qualified staff, pursue accountability and reconciliation, facilitate humanitarian assistance, and begin the processes of reconstruction, reform, and constitutional over overhaul. And finally, in this ideal Syria that uh, Barack Obama would like to hand off, refugee return and reintegration would be underway. Now, bringing about these five characteristics, uh, or at least making significant progress in achieving them, would form the objective. The strategy I'd like to think about would involve three elements. One, defeating ISIL militarily in eastern Syria, ideally before another Paris-like incident. This would require a ground combat component powerful enough to close with and kill the enemy. Ideally, this component would be drawn largely from regional states. At present, the appetite is not there. It would have to be stimulated by a sustained and heavy American diplomatic lift. It would have to include American skin in the game. It would have to feature sustained American leadership for the duration. The second element of the proposed strategy would center on protecting Syrian civilians from the mass casualty atrocities of the Assad regime. Doing so would deprive ISIL of a recruiting tool, fulfill a practical precondition for productive negotiations and political compromise, and mitigate the premier humanitarian abomination of our time. Diplomacy first, urge Russia and Iran to take their client out of this filthy business. This, I would hope, would be the focus of today's meeting in New York, although I doubt it will be so. But if the Russians and Iranians can't do it or won't do it, limited military countermeasures would be justified to make it somewhere between hard and impossible for the Assad regime to continue to kill people at wholesale rates. Uh, my preferred methodology would involve standoff systems such as cruise missiles and would avoid anything that has the word zone attached to it. Uh, third and finally, giving the Syrian opposition an opportunity with financial and technical support to establish decent and effective governance in areas liberated from ISIL. If the Assad regime chooses at Vienna to negotiate, it will have an interlocutor. If it continues with collective punishment and mass homicide, it would face a non-ISIL alternative, capable ultimately of replacing it, albeit sometime during the term of Mr. Obama's successor. Now, none of this, none of it would be easy. All of it would be very problematical. Options have narrowed over the years from bad to worse. But if the objective of the Obama administration is to hand to its successor the kind of Syria I described, it cannot, in my view, rely on the good intentions of Russia's president and Iran's supreme leader. It cannot leave Syrian civilians defenseless. And it certainly can't wait for an ISIL planned mass slaughter operation in the United States to defeat these people in Syria. At the very least, the administration should, should bequeath to its successor a Syria in which ISIL is gone, Syrian civilians are protected from regime atrocities, and a decent alternative to the regime itself is taking root in areas liberated from ISIL and expanding into rebel-controlled areas of northwest and southwest Syria, uh, an authority that can build an all-Syrian national stabilization force that could, if need be, eventually oust the regime that made ISIL possible in the first place. 
a regime whose continued existence sustains ISIL. If my assumptions about Russia and Iran are wrong, they would oppose none of this. Indeed, if my assumptions were wrong, uh, they will promote the inclusive Syrian government they signed up for at Vienna and will send their client packing forthwith. Thanks. Dr. Inuzensep, what about those <coughs> assumptions that uh, Fred Hoff has laid out there? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, my uh, task was uh, much easier than Mr. Hoff's because uh, I was asked to speak about uh, the causes and the aims of the Russian uh, actions in Syria. So I will sum up my presentation in several points and then maybe I will comment if I have time you know, for what I have heard just before. So um, if one looks on uh, major drivers of Russian actions in Syria, some of them were mentioned already. So first of all, it's of course the chance for Mr. Putin to confront the United States and to confront the United States policies of intervention, which he opposed for many years so far, beginning from uh, the operations in uh, Iraq and then uh, even before uh, Mr. Putin came to power, it was uh, the Russian opposition to the operations of the Western powers in uh, Yugoslavia, then in Iraq, in Libya, and so forth. So uh, here, Mr. Putin definitely sees the possibility to stop the American intervention and the American involvement and to counter it. So this is, I think, the first rationale behind these actions. The second one, uh, I would say that Russia, for long, ceased to be um, a global power, a superpower. Uh, and uh, all the actions in Eastern and Central Europe and in Ukraine in the last months, uh, they are also making, uh, putting at risk the Russia's position as even the regional power. I think Mr. Putin wants to, by intervening in Syria uh, and claiming Russia is once again a global power, just to draw attention to, to his homeland as to the regional player. Of course, actions in Syria are not the global actions and uh, the actions of superpower in the Soviet sense, but nevertheless, it's uh, some kind of claim for uh, renewed regional status. So it's just uh, calling for taking me seriously once again. And the next point, of course, is that uh, using the possibility that the Western countries are definitely challenged by the terrorist threat, Mr. Putin wants to uh, make, uh, to find some common ground with uh, both the United States and Europe uh, on the anti-terrorist or counter-terrorist agenda and to find out some grounds to restore uh, the troubled relationship between Russia and the United States and in the West in general, which are in very bad shape after Ukrainian conflict. So these are, I think, the three, three drivers. Uh, and there are more concrete issues, five of them domestic, three international. Uh, domestically, first of all, it's of course uh, Mr. Putin wants to have a small war outside Russian borders and even outside the post-Soviet space for claiming and for um, showing his fellow citizens that the Russia is staying off of his needs, its needs, and it's now once again active in the global uh, arena. The second point is of course uh, the change of focus from economic issues, which were critical for Mr. Putin uh, during his uh, first 10 years in power, to political ones and to geopolitical and to military issues, because the economy is doing not so well, uh, as everybody knows, and since Mr. Putin returns to the Kremlin, returned to the Kremlin, uh, the GDP growth rates are falling down from around 4.9% uh, in the first quarter of 2012, when Medvedev was still president, to, uh, you know, uh, to, to turning red now. Uh, and we have, I think, around 4% of GDP slump this year. So uh, Mr. Putin needs to turn attention from the economic issues to political issues and more to geopolitical and to military ones. So this is also a, a, an element of his strategy. The third one is, of course, to, uh, to, to take, uh, to turn the attention of Russian citizens predominantly from Ukrainian issues, which are now exhausted, to a new one, to a new battlefield, uh, because uh, everything which happens now in Ukraine is not so encouraging, and Mr. Putin really doesn't have any strategy to go out uh, from, from eastern Ukraine. So therefore, it needs another hot point in the world to, uh, to, to present himself as a hero there. Uh, and two latest issues is, uh, first of all, uh, that, uh, during several years, 
uh, the military in, the, in Russia were not in very good shape because, first of all, they were humiliated uh, during the Serdukov tenure as a Minister of Defense, and then uh, they were involved in Ukrainian military operations, uh, you know, hiddenly. It, it was not uh, publicly uh, announced that uh, Russia is involved in Ukraine. It was, you know, uh, some kind of hidden operation, and therefore now they have the possibility for the first time in many years to, to act openly, to test their new uh, military capabilities, and so to protect, we will say so, uh, in this way, to protect the Russia outside. So this is also to please uh, uh, the military and the military industrial complex, which is quite important. It provides around 15 to 17 percent of all manufacturing jobs in Russia, and the military personnel and the members of the families are a big support group for Mr. Putin. And the last one, of course, uh, it's a terror threat uh, because uh, the, the, the fighting with terrorists even maybe in some uh, grotesque way, was for many years Mr. Putin's big game. Uh, and now, by uh, you know, taking once again this issue of anti-terrorist fight, Mr. Putin wants to capitalize on, on, on this issue. Three uh, reasons for uh, on international, uh, if, uh, international scale is, of course, uh, uh, the relationship with Iran because Iran was for many years a good friend of Russia and an ally for, for Russia in the Middle East. Now, after the Iranian uh, nuclear deal and after the sanctions may be lifted in uh, January, so Iran, uh, Russia feels that Iran is going out of its sphere of influence, so uh, Putin somehow maneuvered uh, to, uh, to, you know, to retain or regain the um, good relationship with Iran with the common cause of uh, stabilizing Syria because, as it was mentioned, it's a very uh, crucial issue for Iranian politicians to stabilize the Syria and to uh, have a control again, uh, um, uh, on, on Syria and Assad. Uh, the second point was, as I already said, uh, some kind of uh, cooperation with the United States on anti-terrorist agenda and what we have seen now in New York and uh, Kerry's visit to Moscow also proves that uh, Putin is quite successful in this. And the last, um, but maybe not the least point, is that uh, Mr. Putin wants to uh, make some kind of trade-offs over Ukraine. What will happen next? I will finish with this. Uh, I think that the Russians will uh, definitely try to stabilize the situation and to keep Assad in power for whatever long they can. Uh, I can admit that they will launch a ground operation, uh, maybe not a very extensive one, but they will, because they want to show up as a leader of anti-terrorist coalition, so they, I think they can send the troops to the ground fight. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I would say that uh, I don't trust uh, the Russian leadership in some kind of decent negotiation with the West. Uh, they have di you have different agendas, so I cannot see any uh, fruitful compromise to, to, to be reached. Uh, the very last remark about the American strategy, because it was mentioned today, I would say that I, I doubt that someone can achieve uh, a victory over uh, the Islamic State there. I really doubt that we can speak for, uh, in future for about a united and uh, you know, sovereign Syria. I think uh, the best way to do uh, the job is actually to uh, make a partitioning of the state because it's really unviable for, for, for the years to come. Maybe Mr. Assad can, can continue his rule in a very small part of the country, uh, but uh, I Completely, I'm completely sure that you will never succeed in, in, uh, in defeating uh, ISIS um, or ISIL in coming years. Uh, I, I think that if Mr. Mr. Putin wants to do this, let, 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 him, let him try. It will be a good experience for the Russians. Uh, and uh, if you want to have a very uh, necessary and very good uh, ally on the ground, uh, we should openly speak about the possibility of independent Kurdish state in this place. So I think that Syria is gone, uh, the military victory is unachievable, and uh, the strong coalition with Russia is also out of question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I see a um, painful overlap in your validation of the assumptions, particularly struck by uh, your point, Vladislav, that you don't see a common purpose between mm -hmm. what Russia is about and what Secretary Kerry is about, for example, in New York. That is a, 
um, very sobering thought. So if we're back in the zero-sum game days, uh, part of the reason we, we were going to split today's uh, program into this first panel, talk about how we got here, with the idea that the second panel would be where we go from here. But there's, in fact, substantial uh, uh, overlap. And I, I don't know if we want to have the two presenters refine anything before we go to the other uh, commentators on this. or. Then, in that case, Professor Stent. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here. I enjoyed reading both papers very much, and I really don't disagree with anything uh, that you said, Slava. Um, I'm going to just confine my remarks to Russia uh, and Russian goals, um, and just maybe reinforce some of the things you said, but you're not going to get any good news from me either. Um, so I think, just to reinforce what you said, uh, that Russia has multiple goals in its uh, uh, campaign uh, today in Syria, and some, but not all, are actually related to Syria itself. Um, so I wanted to just say a few more words about the broader context that you know, both of you have already alluded to. Um, Vladimir Putin believes that Russia has a right to a seat at the table on all important international discussions. He believes that the United States has tried to deny him this right for the past 25 years. Um, and so he wants to show that he is back and to insist that the US and its allies recognize that Russia's interests here are as legitimate, uh, if not more legitimate, than the West's uh, goal. So he's really forced the United States to deal with him, um, really, since this began, after the US and its allies for 18 months have tried to isolate Russia uh, because of what's happened in Ukraine. And I think he's been quite successful in that, because right now, he's the sort of go-to man uh, if you want to get something done on Syria, as we saw uh, with Secretary Kerry's visit uh, to Moscow a few days ago. Now, I think a second context here is that Putin does believe that not only that Russia has a right to a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space, and he's been trying to get the West to recognize this. He talks about the need for a new Yalta and things like that. But I think he by now believes that Russia has a right also to establish, to reestablish its influence in areas beyond Russia, particularly the Middle East, where the Soviet Union had quite a lot of influence, and of course where Russia lost this after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and we see this, I see this as a broader uh, strategy of Russia to recoup its influence in the Middle East. Um, if you look at the last six months, we've had the leaders of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Ku Kuwait, uh, the United Arab Republic, and um, Israel visit Moscow. Saudi Arabia, at least on paper, <laughs> uh, promised uh, a $10 billion investment in Russia, uh, which would be mainly in the agricultural sector. Um, we were talking about this uh, with Mark Katz beforehand. That may well not happen. If it did happen, it would be the largest single investment uh, in Russia. And given the history of Russia's relations with Saudi Arabia, that is in itself a very interesting uh, data point, if you like. And then, of course, the new element in Russian policy in this part of the world since the Soviet collapse has been this burgeoning uh, Russian-Israeli relationship um, and the fact that from Israel's point of view, uh, Bashar Assad may not be uh, their desired leader, but he's certainly from their point of view better than what might come after him in terms of Israel's own security. So this really is Russia wanting uh, the West to recognize that it has a right uh, uh, to reestablish its, its influence in this part of the world. Um, I also agree with Slava that a lot of this is about domestic politics in Russia. Um, I won't go into this, um, but obviously you have, as you point out, a, a failing economy, low oil prices. I mean, they keep going down <laughs> under $40 a barrel now, <laughs> economic stringency, and therefore it's very important to keep burnishing this enemy image um, of the West, of, of the United States, and now it's Islamic State. Uh, you know, Ukraine has disappeared from Russian TV. It's all uh, international terrorism now. I mean, Putin has to keep showing himself as a very strong leader um, who can deal with these threats to Russia. Um, and I think there's a basic paradox that you see here at the moment, because the United States continues to be demonized um, in, in Russian media. And if you listen to some of the statements made of officials, uh, we had Mr. Narishkin a couple of days ago saying it was time to abolish NATO when he was speaking in Serbia. So, so you've got the enemy image of the United States, but you also have now uh, the public face, and Mr. Putin again saying in his press conference, very interesting press conference uh, yesterday, uh, 
that yes, Russia and the US, the two big powers should join together and lead uh, this coalition against Islamic State and it's going to be like uh, the anti-Hitler um, alliance uh, uh, during World War II. Um, and um, then you really have to ask yourself, is there some kind of a cognitive dissonance uh, between these two approaches to, to dealing uh, with the United States? Um, just a couple of comments on the Russian view of President Assad, and this has already been said. Um, from, from Putin's point of view, the support for Assad you know, has to do with Russia's own goals in Syria, but it also has to do with this very neurologic issue of regime change. So uh, Vladimir Putin is, is putting Russia forward as the champion of established, you know, sovereign governments all around the world. Obviously, uh, from the Russian point of view, um, a secular strongman in Syria is far preferable uh, to anything else. Uh, but putting Russia forward as a defender of these kind of rulers in that part of the world, as opposed to uh, the State, Russia, the status quo power, as opposed to the US that goes around the world uh, trying to do regime change. I found it very interesting that Mr. Kerry actually said finally in Moscow, we're not interested in regime change, um, which we, you know, I don't think any US official has quite said that way before. Um, and so from the Russian point of view, um, President Putin's pointed out, the US abandoned Hosni Mubarak. Um, you know, it abandoned Muammar Gaddafi. It's abandoned all these leaders. And so this is all about supporting, you know, a legitimately, from Russia's point of view, elected leader in this part of the world. Um, and um, uh, so I think, um, yeah, and I think what, another interesting thing is at the Valdai conference in October uh, in Sochi, Mr. Putin said that Russia doesn't really distinguish between Islamic State and other opposition groups in Syria, that as far as Russia is concerned, they're all terrorists. Now, I know we've had um, some other things said recently, and, and then there was that question, did Putin really say that Russia was supporting the Free Syrian Army, and then Mr. Piskov walked it back. But I think there's also that, that kind of feeling that you cannot really distinguish between the different groups in Syria. Um, so I think going forward, um, um, it's, um, you know, I think it's unlikely um, that we're going, that the US and Russia are going to really be able to work together uh, to form a coalition to defeat the Islamic State. I agree with what was said before, that for Russia, Islamic State isn't the issue. It's uh, supporting the Assad government, maybe a government that might come f afterwards as long as Russia has uh, a say in what that government is and retains its influence there. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so I think it, it's highly unlikely that this is going to, is going to work, um, nor do I, can I really see Russia and the United States agreeing on a transition in Syria, because again, it's a fundamentally different view uh, of Mr. Assad and what might happen after him. And I think the best that's going to happen between the US and Russia is, you know, to continue to deconflict our air operations. Um, and we'll continue talking in all of these different fora. Um, uh, but I think that's the most that we can accomplish. More uh, <laughs> support for the, the thesis. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kravitz. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the Atlantic Council for inviting me as well. And uh, have uh, certainly both papers I thought were extremely interesting. In fact, uh, you know, with Fred Hoffs, I, I, I agree with just so much of it. I especially agree with his points that uh, Russia and Iran are more focused on supporting Assad than on defeating uh, ISIL. Also that Moscow sees support for Assad as important for defeating uh, what it sees as America's uh, democratization jihad. Uh, Moscow seeks to eliminate all Syrian alternatives to Assad and ISIL, thereby leaving the West with the choice between Assad and ISIL ruling Syria and presuming the West is going to see Assad as less worse um, as an alternative. Uh, I also think that he's right in saying that uh, for Moscow, the main utility of the Vienna negotiating process is, is that it's a delaying tactic during which uh, Moscow can support Assad, and it's not an actual conflict resolution process. I agree with his overall critique of the Obama administration policy, calling for Assad to step aside, at least they used to, uh, but not doing anything either to make this happen or to stop Assad uh, from targeting uh, his own uh, population with conventional means. I do disagree with Hoffman. On, on one point, 
Uh, he argues that it's necessary to defeat ISIL in Syria in order to prevent further attacks, uh, such as the recent one in Paris. It seems to me that even if ISIL uh, was completely eliminated in Syria, such attacks could still occur. ISIL exists in many other places besides Syria. Uh, further, even if ISIL were eliminated everywhere, other jihadist groups or sympathizers could launch such attacks. These concerns, of course, uh, do not mean that the defeat of ISIL in Syria is not a worthwhile goal, but we must be realistic about what will result from it. Uh, I find Hoff's proposed strategy for the US and Syria to be quite sensible, and, and this alone explains why it won't be implemented, Fred, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, more seriously, uh, Russia and Iran are not the only actors in Syria for whom the defeat of ISIL is not the highest priority. Indeed, while virtually every actor supports this goal, it's not really the highest priority for any of them. Uh, I think for Turkey, uh, Keeping the Kurds down uh, is more important than, than defeating ISIL. For Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, uh, Iran's presence in Syria uh, is more of a threat than, than, than is ISIL. For the Obama administration, I think the possibility of another large-scale uh, US military intervention that's more of a threat than, than ISIL. Uh, for the EU, for Jordan, for Lebanon, I would argue that the refugee flows are more of a threat than ISIL. Uh, and so I, I think that this is the problem, that everyone opposes ISIL, but everyone has some more important goal that they pursue, and therefore it's not the priority, not, not the actual priority for, for anyone. Uh, turning to uh, Professor Inozemsev's paper, I agree with most of his points as well, especially that Putin is motivated not just by concerns about Syria, but larger geopolitical and domestic concerns in formulating his policy toward that country. Uh, I think he's dead on when he says the Iranian nuclear agreement was something that actually worried Moscow, and Russian intervention in Syria allowed Moscow, to quote from him, to find new points of cooperation with Tehran that could prevent Iran's unpredictable moves, both in political and economic issues i.e. moving somehow toward the West. Uh, I also feel, uh, agree with him that Moscow may well feel impelled to introduce ground forces into Syria since Assad's forces control so little there despite Russian air support. As we have learned, air support alone doesn't uh, protect uh, a weak ally. But if this ground operation does indeed occur soon, as soon as he indicates, uh, Russian Russian hopes to emerge naturally as the leading force in any prospective anti-terrorist co coalition, in my view, may remain unfulfilled. The basic problem with Putin's approach to Syria, as outlined by Inozemsev, is that while it is directed against the West, it is also intended to gain Western support for Russia as not just a member, but the leader of the coalition against ISIL and terrorism in general. But even if the U.S. does not actually oppose a Russian ground offensive in Syria, it's hardly likely to support it, much less treat Moscow as the leader of the coalition uh, against ISIL. There's another alternative, and that is to simply let Russia suffer from all the ill effects of intervention in the Middle East that Washington is all too familiar with, and Moscow should be as well. Uh, it is then so refers to the belief in Moscow that America will somehow be forced to cooperate with Moscow in Syria and elsewhere. But this is not inevitable by any means. Indeed, there are those in the West uh, who may calculate that at a time when Russian hostility toward the West is rising, it's much better for the West if it's Russia and not the West that's bogged down in an in one unwinnable Middle Eastern conflict. Many would argue, of course, that the Obama administration does not think in such Machiavellian terms, and that the recent visit by Secretary Kerry to Moscow, during which he reportedly backed off from Washington's previous position, that Assad had to go to agreeing with Moscow's position that the Syrian people should decide, proves this. Now, I think in, in John Kerry's defense, I'd like to say that that he and Mr. Lavrov clearly have different expectations about just what it is the Syrian people will decide about Assad, uh, but that obviously this, this is a, a change in approach and one that Moscow welcomes. And this leads me to an observation about Putin's call for a broad alliance against ISIL similar to the broad alliance against Hitler during World War II. Everyone is familiar with the adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But there's another adage about alliances that goes as follows. When the purpose of an alliance comes to an end, the alliance itself comes to an end. When Hitler was defeated, the Western allies in the Soviet Union quickly disagreed about who should govern in Eastern Europe. 
What this suggests is that if ISIL is defeated or its strength appears to be significantly degraded, differences about who should govern Syria among the coalition partners fighting ISIL will reemerge as strongly as ever. If Inozemtsev is right that Moscow intends to deploy ground troops to Syria, then Putin may calculate that their presence there may be the deciding factor about who rules Syria, just as the presence of the Soviet army in Eastern Europe at the end of World War II was the deciding factor about who came to power there. Now, Sunni powers, led by Saudi Arabia, though, may see what became of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in the 19. 80s as the guiding analogy for what could happen to what they will see as a Russian occupation of Syria. In the United States, even if the Obama administration may not be employing a Machiavellian logic, it's allowing Moscow to take the lead in Syria may enable the next administration to do so. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that point. I, I was going to ask if someone, because we have actually heard attributed to White House sources at least, people speaking of uh, the Russians being caught in the Syrian quagmire as you know, welcome to it. So uh, we, this is something we can pursue in a bit. So Ambassador, Minister Dean Fahmy, if you could give us a perspective on all that you've heard, but also this question of uh, Arab world reaction to what the Russians are doing. And, and how are they, are they calculating their long-term interests in an, an accurate way, or making some serious miscalculations here? Well, let me, let me start by saying that I'm going to be the devil's advocate, frankly. Uh, one, because I enjoy it, and secondly, because I think it, it's necessary to have a rational discussion about this. Uh, secondly, given the last speaker, I'm going to throw out my conclusion first and then explain why. This is not about whether you're going to co engage Russia or whether you're going to compete with Russia or whether you're going to cooperate with Russia, you're going to do all three of them at the same time. It's simply a, a reality that neither the US, the West, Russia, or the Arab world, or for that, or that matter, Iran, has a conclusive tool in its hand to either solve the Syrian issue or to deal with ISIS alone. So we're going to have to do all of that at the same time. Uh, the real question isn't whether we do that. The real question is, are we going to pursue crisis management or conflict resolution? And there are two different things. And that applies to the ISIS issue, and it also applies to the Syrian issue. Uh, depending on whether we decide we want to limit the damage rather than solve the problem, there's a level of cooperation that we can actually achieve without pushing that. Uh, on the other hand, if you're trying to resolve the problem, then there's going to have to be a grand bargain, uh, not only between the US and Russia, but also among regional players, because they will all have to make serious compromises that are strategic rather than tactical. Uh, let me go back a little bit and try to address this Russian issue. But just before saying that, I'm always sort of provoked by sort of my non-aligned background, which goes a long way back. Many people here don't remember that, uh, by people telling me, who has the right to intervene in my region? So I mean, the, what seems to be provoking people here is, does Russia have the right? Well, who gave you the right? But I need you, and I need the Russians. So it's not a matter of whether we need, whether, whether you'll be there or not. I'm going to invite you, as I will invite the Russians, to come and help us address these issues, because frankly, I can't solve them alone. You can't solve them alone either, by the way. Because if, and as was said by the speakers here, does anybody really believe you can deal with ISIS without ground forces? Who's going to put them? Will the Americans, will the Russians, will the Arabs alone, will the Iranians, will anybody put them alone? So we're going to have to find a way to work together. The issue is how much we do this and how much not. But let me go back to the Russian issue. I went, uh, when I was foreign minister with, at the time, Field Marshal Sisi to Russia, and we met President Putin. He spent an hour with him. 45 minutes, he spoke about extremism and the threats to, uh, to, to Russia from extremists. And we went through the whole package of, extre of extremists. 10 minutes, Western arrogance, which is both personal and political. A few minutes on geopolitics. And then, of course, we spent a little bit of time, I mean, 
in, in at least uh, Egyptian terms, an hour is more than 60 minutes. So it's, uh, we spent some time on, on Egypt, Russia, per se. I actually believe, and it doesn't contradict what's been said or what's in the papers here, but it complements that. I think those are the reasons driving him. I think he is serious about being concerned about extremism. There's no question that he is angry about uh, how he's perceived that his country has been treated by the West and that he has geopolitical interests. That's no question either. There's a, clearly, he has those interests. Um, my question to all of you, frankly, is can you do it without the Russians? Since you can't, then it's how you do it with the Russians rather than whether you give the Russians a role or not give them a role. And nobody here is, I, looking at the age bracket here, very few would be naive, frankly. Uh, nobody here believes that any of us pursue policies without an interest. So we obviously have an agenda, obviously have an interest. But the positive side that I see in all this is we all know we cannot do it alone. So there'll be a point in time where we will have to start engaging the others. And probably we'll, there'll be setbacks where we move away. Uh, I am, from my contacts with the Russians over the last year, they know very clearly that their military operations are not sustainable long term, that they need to move from that phase to a political phase. And I would argue also, I don't think that the Vienna talks uh, took us to a new level. But there's no question that the intervention by the Russians created a sense of urgency, be it that the West got scared that they're going to play their role again, or on the ground that all the parties came together for the first time, the regional parties as well, and came to Vienna. Uh, it created a sense of urgency that this issue has to be dealt with. So in that respect, I actually find the intervention as a tool, not the policy. The intervention as a tool, I see it tactically as having had a reasonably positive effect. Now, is, it, is the policy right depends on what we do after the intervention. In other words, if this ends up being different parties simply using force without a policy paradigm that we work on to try to solve the ISIS issue or the, the Syrian issue, then you're going to have a lot of different forces on the ground, and it's going to be very, very dangerous for all of us. Uh, and therefore, the result would be this is much more negative than positive. But if it causes uh, all the different parties, be that, as I think Henry Kissinger said recently, that the Russians have been out of the Middle East, or at least most of the Middle East, since after the 73 war, and now they're back. Well, they're back. And they're back for a reason. Nobody else was there, and there were a lot of problems. Uh, but as a Middle Easterner, frankly, I will engage the West as much as I can to help solve what's happening in the, in the Middle East, and I will engage the Russians equally so to help solve that. From the Middle Eastern perspective, there's tremendous sensitivity and a little bit of an exaggeration, frankly, as to how many conspiracies the West has managed to get the Middle East to where it is. I'm not a big conspiracy fan, although you give me a lot of ammunition to, to think <laughs> and move in that direction. Uh, but nevertheless, we can't solve this without the West, and we can't solve it without Russia. So my, my argument to all of you, frankly, is, yeah, sure they have interests. Sure they have agenda. Sure they want to have, play a role there. Uh, but how can I take advantage of that rather than uh, is this going to be a coalition where we all embrace the same goals exactly and walk uh, at, at the same pace? Uh, or are we, is our competition necessarily uh, mutually exclusive where we have to hurt each other more than we gain? Uh, it, it depends. If, if I frankly believe that uh, engaging Russia is a good thing, and I also believe that uh, they understand that there's only so much you can do without engaging other parties, uh, but I'm not ready to say yet that this step per se uh, is the beginning of the solution. That depends on the politics after that. Nabil, beyond the, uh, the sectarian issues that are involved there in, say, the motivations of uh, Gulf states uh, versus Iran, or Iran's sectarian motivations, 
do you detect in all your travels across uh, your region of the world much sensitivity to the humanitarian cost and attributing the blame for that to Iranians and Russians uh, and Assad? A lot of Fred Hoff's thesis is that one point of uh, world diplomacy ought to be at least agreement on that, on stopping the barrel bombing, uh, some sort of ceasefire that at least stops the depredations against civilians. And it's clear what the source of that is. It's a Russian-made aircraft uh, flown by Syrian pilots, presumably, with uh, Russian materiel. Is there a sensitivity there? Or is that not even in the, the secondary or tertiary level of conversation? Six, seven months ago, I would argue that you could look at the center and east of the Arab Middle East as being more sensitive to Western interventions hmm. than Russian interventions. And the, the, from the center to the west, they're more sensitive about the uh, Russian intervention. Uh, now, whether it's because of real politic or otherwise, uh, there still is a lot more sensitivity regarding the Russian intervention in the western part of the Arab world, particularly the Gulf. But I think there's a larger degree of realism that, well, can they be pushed in the positive direction? And the point that Angela made just before, how many Arab leaders have been there, but, and even non-Arab leaders have been there. Uh, I think this is a good point. I, we will have agreements and disagreements with the Russians. I don't question that. Uh, we don't necessarily agree on everything they do. Uh, and we don't disagree on everything they do either. But can we afford to do it without them? If we could, frankly, I'd do it without them and without the Americans and everybody else. We can't. Sure. So, uh, and I actually believe that while they may have policies that we differ with, they are rational people pursuing those policies. So I believe in, in, in the value of diplomacy trying to engage them because I have no other, no, no other alternative. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, I am ready to have a, uh, if we're living in quote unquote, as, as the uh, aviation uh, term is in an open society or open skies, there will be competition out there. So that doesn't really concern me that much. But the point that I think as a mis Middle Easterner, we have to emphasize much more is that the debate shouldn't be about whether it is, an, whether it affects Western interests or whether the Western in involvement affects Russian interests. But it really should be focused first, not exclusively, but first on does this help solve the problems of the region? That's really my point of departure. And part of that leads me to come to conclusions uh, that are completely real politic. Do I think we can, uh, I mean, if, if there was a clear solution to how we move from where we are in the, in the tragedies in Syria to a new Syria, we'd do it. But there is no clear solution. And even if you drew it up, and I can draw up a couple of formulas, uh, the process of getting there is very complicated. And one of the issues that have been raised, uh, well, how long, first of all, does or does he not, and then how long, if he does, Bashar stay into the process is one of the questions. Uh, clearly, you're negotiating about a new Syria. It shouldn't be the reinvention of the old Syria. But to get there, I can't simply talk to my friends. I have to talk to the other parties on the ground. Uh, and as angry as I understand and I respect and I agree with the Syrian opposition in their, in their anger with, with Bashar, there are a lot of other despicable characters, frankly, on the ground uh, that uh, are of tremendous threat uh, to the Middle East. So it's, again, it's not simply I'm going to talk to these, I'm going to talk to the others. It's, it's complicated. So because of the complexity, we need to engage each other as mature, rational people, understand that I may differ with you on some interests, but nevertheless, it's better for me to engage you rather than to say, well, your interests are different from mine, and therefore, uh, we won't play cards. Okay. And before we uh, turn to uh, broader questions and discussion, if I may take the privilege also of uh, asking you, Vladislav, nobody mentioned the word Turkey, which along with Egypt and the Arab world is, is close to my heart. Is a, a lot of my professional experiences there. It seems to me there has been quite a major uh, turn in Turkish relations, quite a dramatic one, with 
I, I was there until a year ago, and we had people, we had Putin, uh, we had visits back and forth and between uh, the then prime minister and then later the president. People around uh, now President Erdogan praising Putin to the skies uh, publicly. Um, and then very dramatic turn uh, even before the uh, November, late November shootdown of the airplane uh, in Russian-Turkish relations, going back almost to a, a Cold War kind of rhetoric, uh, making us all rather anxious. Do you have any insight or comment on that and, and how that is playing and how that is factoring into uh, Mr. Putin's outlook on the region and what he's trying to do in Syria? or even prospects for managing it? Uh. Uh, if I, can, uh, I would not say that uh, Mr. Putin has changed his agenda due to all this um, showdown with, uh, with Turkey. I think that uh, he never believed before that Turkey can be an ally in this fight. And what happened uh, with this uh, incident with Russian uh, air, uh, airplane uh, is one, look, it. Um, it just benefited uh, a bit Mr. Putin because it enlarges uh, his strategy of uh, confrontation of, with uh, whomever mm -hmm. uh, can you know, challenge Russia. And uh, uh, in, in, I would say even in the Russian press and the Russian public opinion, the conflict with Turkey these days uh, is uh, even more commented than the, the operation in Syria. And it's, it's um, you know, the continuation of uh, Mr. Putin's policy of counter sanction against the European Union mm -hmm. uh, on closing, closing the Egyptian flight to Egypt for Russian, closing the Egypt for Russian tourists. And now it's once again, uh, you know, a proof that Russia is strong, that it can uh, somehow, uh, you know, uh, abandon the economic relationship with, uh, with anyone who can challenge the Russians. So that's it. It's, uh, from, from my point of view, what is going on with Turkey from, from Moscow, it seems so. Uh, it's just uh, you know, another kind of, uh, of a propaganda effort from Mr. Putin's side. If I could just add a mm -hmm. small thing. If you um, read what Mr. Putin said yesterday in his press conference about Turkey and the United mm -hmm. States, I'm not going to repeat it because it wasn't very polite, but, <laughs> but sort of, um, again, linking Turkey with the US. And so Turkey is now, again, part of the general, uh, uh, you know, uh, propaganda that you see in the Russian TV and, and what the Russian officials are saying about you know the West being out to threaten uh, to threaten Russia and they were, they've even had things on Russian TV suggesting that it was the US that told the Turks to do this so really? it seems to me that's yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. actually it's a link it. between yeah. maybe not Turkey and US but definitely between Turkey, Turkey and, and NATO, NATO. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but the U NATO yeah. is the US definitely. right <laughs> exactly yeah. and the bill as far as the uh, other Russian airplane that went down over Sinai. It looks like the, the two sides are overcoming that. Uh, which two sides? Well, uh, Egypt and, and Russia. No, we're not on different sides, frankly. Uh, the fact is the plane went down. There is a official committee that's investigating that. And they're bound by only coming up with public statements uh, once they have conclusive evidence. So they, and I say this from past experience, having followed the Egypt air crash way, way back in 99. Uh, they can't come up and say, we expect this or we think it's this. They have to come out and say, this is the evidence that says so-and-so. So they will ultimately come out much later than uh, intelligence sources or other government officials. Uh, the Russians have said that they think it's a, a terrorist act. Uh, so in terms of the public statements, uh, there's a difference between the Russians and the committee. But the Egyptian government has not said anything because that's not its role, per se. Uh, either. Whatever it is, it's a tragedy, and we need to find out what it is. And uh, whether it was done by a terrorist or, or not, uh, it's important to find that out. But nobody has questioned that uh, if there is terrorism in this, and we haven't denied that as Egyptians, we will make that announcement. Frankly, in many respects, uh, it's never going to be an excuse that we will use cynically. But if it is clear that a terrorist did it, that's much clearer answer than if you say, well, somebody got through your security system. So there's no reason for us to hide this, by the way. And, and uh, the countries are moving toward collaboration on getting, improving the security so that 
civil well, just, aviation yes, and Just yesterday, I think, I saw something in the media that uh, we invited the EU security, uh, aviation security uh, team to come in and uh, uh, check the, the airport uh, processes back home and that they see, we, the, the airport facilities seem to have passed that test. So, look, we are a nation that uh, will only really thrive if we have tourism. So we need to ensure that the tourists feel comfortable beyond how much it costs us. So there's no question we will make an extra effort to ensure that. Okay. If, if no further interaction among the panelists, I'll throw it open to the uh, audience and start forward and we'll try to move around. Maybe Judith Kipper. Uh, yes, Michelle, if you can bring the microphone to Ms. Kipper. Thank you. Very good panel. Nabil, I'd like to address my question to you. Uh, but let me start by saying that uh, clearly the misconceived strateg strategically catastrophic war in Iraq by the U.S. disrupted an unstable status quo and made the Arab transition, which was necessary, inevitable, more vicious, violent, faster, uh, virulent, everything you can say about it, and probably helped to create uh, ISIS. Nevertheless, when we look at the problem, uh, the lack of Arab leadership, Arab willingness to participate and help, whether it's militarily helping Syrian refugees, except for Jordan and uh, Lebanon, which are the weakest of the weak, the Gulf states are totally, absolutely, completely preoccupied with their allergy to Iran. They don't talk about Syria or ISIS. Uh, the lack of cohesion in the Arab world. Egypt is a big country with a big U U.S. armed uh, military. Maybe you can't do it without the international community, and it's now become a Russian-American problem. But how do we do it without something, something coming out of the Arab world? And so far, there's next to nothing. There's no answer to, uh, to the problems, but I wouldn't say there's next to nothing. Uh, the, the Egyptian proposal, for example, to create an Arab rapid deployment force was one step towards, well, we need to have the capacity and the tools to deal with threats and not always call on others to do that. Now, that has not gone through yet. It's still up to debate, and there are, there are some countries that are not comfortable with that. Just yesterday, two, two days ago, the Saudis came up with another coalition about terrorism. That's just the beginning, but it, it reflects that the Arab world is starting to look at what can they actually do. Uh, if, I mean, I understand that there's no question that there, there is the humanitarian pressure. And I think, that as, as, as you said correctly, Jordan and Lebanon have carried a lot of this. Egypt, even though it's not on the border, has actually about 400,000 uh, Syrian refugees now. Uh, we need to, and the, and the Kuwaitis, frankly, have, have an annual uh, conference where they provide financial support for, for the refugees. Uh, is this going to be solved completely alone by the Arab world? No. And therefore, the point I made at the end of my comments, there's so much distrust in the region, be that among some of the parties in the region or between some of them and the West and some of them and, and, and Russia, unless we have a better political understanding of what are the limitations of the cooperation and the competition. Unless we have sort of this grand, not grand bargain, maybe that's a bit too much, but at least the grand understanding, you're not going to get uh, a strong commitment to Arab forces or a strong commitment for Western forces or Russian forces that's sustainable. All of these formula will fail unless we have a stronger political understanding. Uh, that's why as much as I'd like to say I have the answer, I'm going to go and do it, I, I openly say I don't have the answer, so I need to talk with people that will actually compete with me and may have different agendas. But that's really my point. Uh, if, and I think this is what your point is, Judith, if the point is the Arabs need to do more, I've been saying that for, uh, for, for years now, so I have no problem with that at all. Fred, you've been calling for an Arab stabiliz a stabilization force uh, based largely on Arab contributions. With, uh, Jim Zogby had his annual poll uh, come out just uh, a week or two ago, which showed actually substantial uh, 
public support, for me a little bit surprising, more than you than I've, I had detected. Any, yeah, any insights you have on the prospects there? Nevertheless, I mean, if, if, uh, if the United States were to mount the kind of diplomatic campaign, I think it should, as an alternative to the president being forced to deploy American soldiers and Marines in the wake of a Paris-like incident occurring in the United States, I think the going in assumption would be certainly at the leadership level in the, re in the, in the region, a very, very, very suppressed appetite hmm. for putting ground forces into eastern Syria against ISIL. Uh, this is an appetite uh, that would have to be stimulated by the United States. I don't, I, I would not in the least Try to try to shortchange or understate uh, the difficulty this particular administration would be making would, would have in making the case uh, that we're in this for the duration. We'll provide the leadership, and we'll put skin in the game. So there may be you know there may be substantial and growing popular support for decisive military intervention against ISIL, but. But my going in assumption is that at the leadership level, uh, the appetite for ground intervention would be very much under control. Mm. Uh, Dr. Rubai, you don't have your hand up, and you're going to be part of the next panel. But for an Eastern Arab perspective, any, any comments on either this issue or any other of the ones we've, we've got to hear? You want to save it for, your, for the next, next panel? OK. Let me uh, jump uh, over to this side, and then, uh, sir, with your hand up. And back and we'll come around. David Colton um, from the Ijiwara Group. My question to the panel. Can you say again from? Uh, Ijiwara Group. Uh, my question to the panel is to hone down on the question of, quote unquote, the Russian offensive. Let's be very candid. The Russian offensive has been a flop to date. Their progress has been measured in scant kilometers. They have maybe about 50 aircraft doing sorties, mostly with unguided bombs. And if we recall, under the Soviet Union, there were 8,000 troops stationed in Syria at the time. If you look at the current tooth-to-tail ratio of the, the Russian military, which is about 7 to 1, 6 to 1, and you, you actually work through the military requirements to maintain a sustained operation, I put to the panel, Putin can't do it. More importantly, the Iranians have taken enormous casualties, not just among senior generals, but at the second lieutenant level. And if the panel may know, the Iranians are talking about it on state TV. And there are reports that the Iranian troops are actually pulling out, meaning that the Russians themselves are gonna have to add more ground pounders, and I put out to you how much of what we're seeing with Putin is the same kind of bluff he tried to daunt with Ukraine. He has tried to get away with a lot on cheap, and I throw to the panel out, when push comes to shove, how much can he really do? Anyone wish to respond to that? Okay, it's a very good, I think it's a very, very good question. Uh, I agree that uh, for hoping uh, to achieve some uh, credible results, you should uh, impose much more and should Im deploy much more forces there. Uh, actually, I would say that economically and financially, it's not a big problem for Russia to, uh, to send their ground troops uh, to Syria because now the operation looks like quite cheap uh, compared to overall Russian military expenditures. Uh, whether they will do this or not, I, my personal position is that they actually will try to do this in some foreseeable future. Mr. Shoigu, who is now Minister of Defense, uh, said on the Collegium of the Minister of Defense two days ago that we will go as far as to Euphrates. So I, I think that uh, it may happen. Uh, and of course, uh, I know that the Iranians are suffering a lot of casualties and the Russians are studying the question. But um, the logic of the operation as, as, as it unfolds uh, asks uh, Mr. Putin to, to intervene on the ground. So this is my point. Of course, they will not succeed. And this was my point. No one can succeed in fighting Islamic State uh, at this uh, point, except of the local forces, uh, which I think they are Kurds. 
uh, if, uh, if, if the West and the Russians want to, to, to go further with this, they should have a good alliance with Kurds. They should promise Kurds the independent state there on, on the, some lands which the Kurds can secure from the uh, uh, influence of uh, Islamic State, and this ca can help. No, no, neither Iranians, nor Russians, nor Americans will succeed in ground operations. But my point was that the Russians will, as I believe, will try to start it. Uh, how, how it goes further, I don't know. But isn't the point that several of you had made earlier, including Fred, that the Russians are not trying to succeed against ISIS, really? As Professor Stent also has yeah, said. Yeah, but look, uh, even the point the, is suppressing all yeah, the opposition. But, but to even they are, uh, even they engage in ground operation against, for example, the so-called <coughs> moderate opposition. They will somehow confront ISIS, and it, it will be some, some clash with this. Uh, what I would like to say, once a very small uh, point, that. Uh, Putin is very, seems to me very controversial in his uh, attitude towards the extremists. It was mentioned here as extremists. Because uh, before uh, it was known that around five to 6,000 people uh, were uh, having Russian passports or having the post-Soviet country citizenship are fighting on the uh, part of ISIS in Syria. And all these people went there in the last two, three years. So. Uh, with, uh, with ISIS uh, having, uh, getting around in Syria, the Russians have succeeded in squeezing out the terrorists and extremists out of Russia. And with bombing the Syrian opposition and ISIS, they are fostering them to come back. And I mm. think that uh, Putin is completely counterproductive in what he's doing in Syria for Russian domestic security. But he's mm. doing what he, what, what he does. Mark and then Angela. Just very quickly. Uh, Putin himself has, has talked about uh, that, that you know, he prefers to fight them there than fight them here in in Russia, and I think that you know as uh, you know I think part of the, part of the problem is that uh, um, you know as we ourselves learned just because we intervene in Iraq doesn't mean that uh, jihadists can't attack targets elsewhere. But I think the real basic problem that that Putin has is that uh, his government does not treat Muslims in, in Russia uh, decently at all. In other words, that no matter what they do, even if they're very successful in Syria, this this is the, this is a huge problem that, that they're not dealing with uh, successfully in Russia itself. I'm not sure that there are many Russian Muslims who are really basically agitated by what's happening in Syria, but they are agitated by what's happening to them in, in Russia itself. And it seems to me that, that Putin's operation in Syria doesn't change this uh, at all. Okay. And miss? Yes, please. Oh, hello, my name is Karina Orlova. I work for Echo of Moscow. Uh, my question is for Mrs. Stent. Um, my question is about Putin's goals in Syria and uh, uh, Assad. So you said that uh, he wants to keep Assad in power, and you also said that um, he um, always supports uh, legitimate regimes, and he always like stands guard for these legitimate regimes, which is com not exactly true because. Um, as you probably remember the first visit of Mikhail Saakashvili when he was elected uh, as a Georgian president was to Moscow, where he was quite warmly accepted. Um, and moreover, Russia um, supported all those three presidents uh, in Kyrgyzia, Bakiev, uh, Rosa Tatumbaeva, and uh, uh, Atambayev, next. So, um, according to this, we cannot say that Putin always stands guard for legitimate regimes, which makes him what he is, probably a great opportunist. And so, when he says uh, that he wants to keep Assad in power, it's just his words, and we all know that he is a liar. And this is not my, uh, this is not me criticizing him, it's just the matter of fact, he lies constantly and publicly. So do you have a question as well as a The comment? question is, uh, how do we believe that he, his goal is to keep Assad in power? Do you, don't you think that he will give, uh, give up Assad as soon as uh, it's like, will be, uh, as he needs it? Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. First of all, I think you misunderstood me. I said that Putin wants to project to the world, and this is what he says, that Russia supports all legitimate rulers, particularly in that part of the world. I didn't say that I agreed with that, but that's certainly um, the message that Russia is sending to that part of the world is, we support the leaders that are in power and we're against regime change, all right? So, th so that's point one. 
No, I th and I, I also said, and maybe I didn't make that clear, I think for the moment, Russia does want to shore up Assad. And going back to the previous question, um, uh, you know, the, the, whether the Ru Russian operation has been successful so far or not. It's been successful in as much as Russia intervened because it was very concerned in the summer that it looked as if, uh, you know, the Assad forces were weakened and that there might really be, you know, that the, the government there might be in danger. And so for now, right? Right? Assad seems to be stronger, and the Russians have achieved limited goals. That doesn't mean if at some point they think it's in their interest to support another leader. Again, as long as they have a say in who that leader is, and they can be reassured that their influence in Syria uh, will last, it's not tied to the man. And Mr. Lavrov has himself said that, that they're not necessarily tied to President Assad. But for the moment, that's where they are. And I think in these talks in Vienna, that certainly is their starting position. Yeah, honestly, I haven't detected from any of the panelists any suggestion that Russian calculations are anything but hard-nosed and based on power and, and interest. Yeah. Nothing emotional about the Well, I think it was pointed out in one of the papers. That's right. There's no love lost. It's just that, sure. you know, at the moment, this is the government that's in power. Not a matter of principle, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you? OK. As a gentleman who's had his arm up, uh, I'm afraid it's going <laughs> to cause pain. Uh, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Given that uh, there, most of the speakers were singing from the same song sheet, or maybe beating on the same drum, I might say, uh, I want to ask a contrarian question. One is with uh, 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 Professor Hoff or Ambassador Hoff's uh, presentation. There was so something of a fallacy of composition in talking about what the Russians and Iranians have to do in order to come to this solution. If you see the Russians and Iranians um, uh, connected at the hip, I think that's a very big mistake uh, because they both have their own interests. They have uh, common interests and they have different interests. And the only way that we can deal with this situation, with Russia especially, where we have a much broader spectrum of interests and issues that have to be dealt with, trying to see them together I think would be the biggest mistake in, in dealing with this problem. Uh, secondly, I'd just like to say, the question is uh, how much uh, Putin's actions are actually proactive. That is, we have to go into Syria to uh, assert our uh, great power uh, aspirations. And how much was reactive? Remember what was happening in Syria right before that uh, was that um, the U.S. was considering having a no-fly zone, which of course would have put that conflict in a much different context. We would be on the way towards regime change by setting up an area which was under our protection. Uh, and I think Putin, if is seeing this, made the Russian moves in order to counter that. And if you see that that way, that was really a brilliant move on his part to throw a monkey wrench into what was going to be a very dangerous development in Syria. With regard to his proposals of working together, I remember when he came to Kenny Bunkport, because I was up there at the time, and talked with Bush after 9-11. He said, let's work together to deal with this terrorism problem. And Bush said, yes, we'll do that. But everything that happened after that, and I think my microphone is going out, everything that happened after that was uh, expansion of NATO, uh, uh, there was the, uh, the missile defense. We didn't follow up on that at all, and I think that was the biggest mistake in the world, so that there is a certain sense from Russia that they have put out the hand of friendship a long time ago, Putin personally, and has been rejected all along. And when they're doing it again, if we try and take if the I attitude could ask the, of refuse, we get it right down to a question I think it's a mistake. Those are gonna... the two questions I'd like to throw on the table. Did you pick on something you can yeah, respond to? Uh, yeah, uh, I think you know when my when my paper is published, you'll you'll see a little bit a little bit more nuance in the question of the uh, of the Russian Iranian relationship in all of this. Uh, they do come at this from an entirely separate set of interests. Uh, where they come together, at least for the time being, at least for the foreseeable future, is in the uh, is in the perpetuation of Bashar al-Assad in power in Syria. Now, I'm, and this, this touches a bit on uh, Nabil's point as well. I am absolutely in favor of engaging the Russians on the question of Syria. 
this, is, this is one thing, I think, for all of the, the shortfalls in American policy over the past few years, uh, this is really probably not an area where we can be criticized. Uh, for most of 2003, John Kerry chased Sergei Lavrov. And when he finally caught him, he got a peace conference in uh, Geneva that was an utter fiasco. Uh, we're chasing again. We've got, a, we've got a Vienna process that we can all hope and pray succeeds. What I would like to see, and I do think we're, we're very much in the crisis management mode. I agree entirely with Nabil that nobody, nobody has the silver bullet that's going to solve this problem. We're in a crisis management. And I think the one thing that is absolutely essential for the United States, Russia, and Iran to agree upon is that attacks, mass casualty attacks on civilian populations are inadmissible under international law and must stop now. And I must say, even if, even if, even if the fact that we're in the middle of the, the premier humanitarian abomination of our time, even if this means nothing to individuals, how, how in the world, how in the world is this Vienna process going to get anywhere with civilians on the bullseye, okay? How, how, how does an opposition delegation come to the table and deal in the, in the spirit of, of goodwill and compromise and political arrangements while its constituency is being blown away on a daily basis. How do we fight ISIL when this, when this marvelous recruiting tool provided by the Assad regime remains in effect? I mean, this is why I think this issue between the United States, Iran, and Russia really needs to be addressed up front. Otherwise, otherwise, this Vienna process becomes an elongated permission slip uh, for continued slaughter, which will, which will stop anything good at all from happening in Syria. A lady here with a comment. Brenda Schaefer, Atlantic Council. You know, the cornerstone of U.S. policy on Syria has been Assad must go. We heard this unequivocally from President Obama, and it's probably one of the only issues that had bipartisan support in the, during the Obama administration, that everyone in the U.S. agreed that Assad must go, but, but uh, no, uh, the debate was about how much U.S. support for him to go. But we've really never challenged the basic premise. Russians came in 2011, told the U.S. that Assad must go's strategy was dangerous. It would lead to destabilization. They have legitimate interests there. They were dismissed by the U.S., um, won their interest and also their, their warnings. And it, maybe we can, four years later, can we say uh, we need to challenge this premise and that maybe the Russians got it right and we should have listened to them? I think given the role of, uh, of Bashar al-Assad in making, making ISIL possible in Syria and his ongoing role in uh, keeping that organization uh, healthy and well inside Syria uh, it tends to, uh, tends to reemphasize the fact uh, that if we had had a strategy uh, to implement the president's words, had we implemented that strategy, we'd be in a much better place than we are now. But we didn't, and so the question still remains. I mean, not having had it, whatever the reason's up to now, <laughs> Yeah. And I guess we can kick that to the next panel, too. Where do we, Let's collectively, do we and the Russians, <laughs> um, sort of go from here? Any other responses yeah. to, the, to that point, Bill? Can I, I, just, can I just add? You know, I think you, you raised, you know, Brenda, a, a very good point. And I think for, from, the, from the Russian point of view, what they saw is that the Syrian problem could be resolved the way Chechnya was resolved. In other words, that the, the, you know, the regime forces come in, essentially just demolish the Islamist opposition, and establish you know, an authoritarian peace, and that, that the same thing could be possible in Syria. It occurred in Algeria, that this is sort of the model, and that after all, you know, why should the West 
uh, complain. We've dealt with Assad regime before. What was the difference between what Assad was doing and what uh, the Algerians did, or what they, uh, or, or even quite frankly, uh, in in the view of, of what what Sisi did in Egypt. In other words, they, they see it as sort of as sort of similar. But I think that what what Fred's indicated is that. Uh, Unfortunately, the continuation of the Assad regime um, is not a recipe for stability. It is a cause of instability, and I think that's that's the trouble: is that there's no, there is no uh, bringing stability about. And I have a feeling that that what we're going to see in Syria is what everyone doesn't want, and that is like Iraq, it's just going to be a de facto split up, only it might actually be more complicated in Syria than, than it is in Iraq. You'll have little fiefdoms, an Alawite area, we'll have a Kurdish area, maybe a Druze area, a Sunni Arab area, ISIL will have its area, and that will have all these little, and, and, and maybe neighboring states will have their little areas of influence as well. Uh, that that's what we're going to actually see, even though that's not what anyone actually wants. Frank, if I can just jump in on this. Um, I think the issue of whether Assad goes or not, and when he goes, for that matter, of course has been a very sensitive issue, and it will continue to be a very sensitive issue. And if you keep asking the question, you won't get an answer. Unless, unless we clarify what happens after. So my suggestion is to do some reverse engineering. In other words, how do we ensure that Syria remains Syria, irrespective of who the Syrians decide to be president. I'm not addressing that, that issue per se. And the reason I say this is if you, if you develop the formula or the guarantees for what will be the day after, you actually factor in what are the interests of the regional states, what are the interests of the states outside of the region. So that makes addressing the question of OK, who is the president? Something where it's a bit more rational than if you simply say, well, OK, he must go or he must not go. But nobody knows what's going to what happen the day after. And I can tell you, because I've done this for a long time, hundreds of scenarios of what would or what not happen. And they're all conflicting with each other, at least a large number of them. So uh, it is a question, and it's going to be a sensitive one. And it will always be a problem until it's answered. But I think you can get closer to the answer if you try to develop the structures for Syria, for the new Syria, and then work back to, OK, he will actually be the president, and how do we choose that president? This reference to the morning after will resonate painfully with Dr. Muafak Rabai and myself when we try to deal with the same issue with respect to Saddam Hussein, Saddam must go. Uh, and the thesis of the United States work with the Iraqi democratic opposition to Saddam Hussein was to construct this idea of the morning after. What would it look like? What would the future look like? I don't regret that. <laughs> but in, I, in fact, I think it was our failure to actually succeed in, in having a clearer vision of how Shiites and Kurds and Sunnis and Christians and all the rest would, would hold that out. Um, the, hmm. Exactly, it was. Anyway, we've got just a couple of minutes. Why don't we see if we can put together uh, whatever questions are there. And then any panelists who would like to sum up, we can do that. I can, uh, let me take the farthest back hand that I can see. Gentlemen, again, you're, you're, yeah, you, the, your, yours is the last hand I can see in the back, and I'll work forward. Your name, please, and organization, if any. You know, from Turkish Heritage Organization. There is a mentioning about the imprecise bombing in Syria that's going on by the Russians. And yesterday, we had a teleconference, and uh, this guy from Syrian American Council, he mentioned that the number of people fleeing Syria has increased, actually, and has been increasing. And a lot of them actually are going to Turkey, 2.2 million uh, refugees currently in Turkey. I was wondering, I've never heard anyone talk about Russia if they're so interested in helping Syria and Assad. Are there any Syrian refugees in Russia, or what is Russia has been doing in terms of refugees? Mm. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, sir, gentleman with the red tie. Uh, Iris Strauss, Committee on Eastern Europe and Russia and NATO. Uh, I'd like to thank our Egyptian colleague, Nabil, for asking us to be mature. And I think that's very helpful. Uh, we've heard that there's a red line on the part of the administration against 
effective use of American force, and that seems to be accepted. If we're going to be mature and accept that, then we have to accept that we make compromises with other people's interests. If we don't accept that, then let's stop accepting it. But we have to make real choices. For four years, we've played a part in keeping Syria enmeshed in civil war. Mr. Kerry at one point said that that is his objective to keep it in a stalemate because he doesn't want our side to win by force. And Mr. Obama has said on several occasions he doesn't want our side to win against ISIS by force. Uh, others on our side can, but we can't. It doesn't do any good, he says, uh, which is a very peculiar argument. It doesn't do every good, therefore it doesn't do any good. I think there is a real need for maturity, and I would like to see us doing as uh, our initial presenter said, to do the right thing and put enough force behind our hopes to give substance to our hopes. We'd still probably have to compromise on some of them. But in the absence of that, we'll have to compromise a lot more with a lot more on things that seem unpleasant to us. And I would like to suggest to Mr. Katz, we can, one can also say that grand coalitions might not solve everything. But to say it wasn't worth it to defeat Hitler because there was Eastern Europe, you didn't say that, you didn't say that but that, that seemed to be the logic. Therefore, it's not worth it to have a grand coalition against ISIS because we might disagree over the future of Syria afterwards, uh, which wouldn't be a new Cold War as Eastern Europe was. Uh, so I think Mr. one has Strauss, to re rethink you. that kind of statement. Got it. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe uh, uh, one more comment only and then I think we're going to have to close. And so one more gentleman here with the white shirt. Hi, uh, my name is Dimitri. Thank you very much. Very interesting. My question is, you said that uh, you believe that the Middle East can't do it without the West and without Russia. Do you think the general population supports that idea, or there's people that just want the West and Russia to get out? And do you, do you think uh, Islamist extremism has increased over the last 10, 20 years, or they just have more avenues and resources at their disposal? More general comments on use of force and questions on popular opinion. People like to sum up and respond to any of these, maybe starting from the bill okay. working sure. this way? Sure, I'll just sum up by answering that question. Yeah. I don't want to repeat what I said before. Uh, I generally believe that the educated public understands that they can't, that in our, in our world, cannot solve it alone and therefore engaging both the Russians and the West, America and, and, and NATO and Europe and all that, is the only realistic way out because, frankly, uh, there is no support for the Arab world alone taking all the risk, nor is there a sense that they can actually succeed if they, if they do that. So I think that's, that exists there. The emotional public dislikes the Russians and the Americans equally, uh, although Americans win a little bit on that. Uh, <laughs> but that's not really where my concern is. My concern is where, who are the activists, who are the serious people who want to engage this, and I would argue uh, the rational thinking is we need to do this uh, together, really. Mark. Yeah, if I could just address the point about the, uh, the Grand Coalition. Uh, I, I think that, you know, that uh, the, the trouble is that there are certain patterns that we see in international relations, not a question of what wants, what, what wants to happen or, or not. And the fact of the matter is that the Grand Coalition against Hitler did not lead to a Grand Coalition going forward. That you know, once the purpose of the alliance came to an end, the alliance came to an end, and I think that we have to expect something similar here. And I think especially with, with Putin's call for this grand alliance in particular, you know, he works against the West uh, in Ukraine in particular in 2014, 2015, and then just simply turn around, oh no, we're going to now, you know, can we be allies together in Syria? I have a feeling that, that that won't be the end of the story. As soon as he can pivot again, he will, he will do so. I think the lady from Echo Moskvi understands the nature of Mr. Putin. Uh, and so I think that, that that's, you know, we have to be very realistic. Yes, we're all against, uh, against ISIL, but if, it, if it's defeated, uh, we're not going to be agreeing on what should be uh, continuing in, in Syria at all. Angela? I'll maybe just take off from that and go back to the question of what the Russians expected in 2001. First of all, the language about the anti-Hitler coalition was also used in 2001. So we should ask, why did it work in 2001 when Mr. Putin went to Crawford uh, and, and uh, met with Mr. Bush and you know, the, you know, the relationship really seemed to be on the uptick then? That was because the Russians were very helpful to the United States in that initial phase in the fall of 2001 in the war in Afghanistan because we agreed on who the enemy was. It was quite clear there wasn't a difference there and, and it was in Russia Russia's interest to have the US and its allies go in there and take care of a problem that had obviously plagued Russia and Russia's neighbors itself. 
Um, we're not in the condition today, and there's, and we, of course, we should try and work with the Russians. Um, but to have a successful coalition like this, we'd have to agree on who the enemy is. And I think the panel has shown that we don't agree on who the enemy is, except by saying, you know, in general, it's Islamic State. But we have very different definitions, and we don't have the trust, which in a way we did have even in that brief window in 2001, because of everything that's happened in recent years, particularly with what's happened in Ukraine and where the Russians have <laughs> failed to say, you know, what they're really doing there. So that is why, yes, we can try, but the conditions, for instance, that made cooperation and counterterrorism cooperation in 2001 possible are not there now. Okay, I, I will just uh, react a little bit on, on the question about the uh, Putin-Bush connection and uh, the possibility of cooperating between the US and Russia. Uh, yes, I agree that uh, it were some prerequisites for such cooperation in the early 2000s. But then um, you mentioned the uh, missile treaty and NATO expansion, the other things. Uh, I think they, are, they have been exhausted since then. Since then. And now, I. We can, of course, try to reestablish some of these connections, but I think it's too late. And Mr. Putin is now on a completely different course than he was uh, 15 years ago. So I, I cannot uh, see any uh, productive coalition uh, uh, under such circumstances as today. And uh, the question about the uh, Syrian refugees in Russia, there are not so many of them. I, I would say there are very few. Uh, and uh, you said about uh, Russia is claiming to help Syria. No, it is helping, it's claiming to help Assad. It, Assad is not Syria. And therefore, Russia simply doesn't care about Syrian refugees because uh, uh, Moscow is helping uh, just Assad, not Syria. Okay. Concluding comment? Yeah, her. just just a couple of comments. I, I would say, you know, first of all, if a, uh, if a coalition of truly professional military forces uh, in sufficient numbers uh, cannot defeat ISIL in eastern Syria. What has this world come to? Do we think, do we think local indigenous forces are going to be able to, to do the job if, uh, if professionals cannot do it? There was an interesting article uh, in the Washington Post the other day, uh, I believe by Liz Sly, not 100% sure, about the effects of sustained Russian bombing uh, in northern Syria, uh, not far from the Turkish border. How this is obstructing, rather decisively, uh, the inflow of humanitarian assistance uh, to needy Syrians at particularly the worst time of the year with the onset, uh, onset of winter. Uh, this, is, this is horrific. Uh, I think discussions you know, about the future of Assad, about uh, the, the composition of the opposition delegation, these are all obviously very, very interesting discussions. But to the extent that they dominate this Vienna process to the effect that the protection of Syrian civilians is excluded from the discussion. It is excluded from American, Russian, American, Iranian diplomacy. Uh, this process, I'm sad to say, would, would go nowhere. One would hope and think, logically even, that it ought to be a, a focus everybody could agree on. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. We're only a couple of minutes over. We need to reconvene very, very promptly at 11.20. And we'll see you all in 15 minutes. Thank you very much to the panelists for coming. <laughs>